I started joking around set. I was like, it's great. If you're amazing, I'm going to get all the credit as the director. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, a great it's true. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley. And today on the show, we have Ricky Staub. Ricky is a writer and director that has a really interesting story of coming from no film school into being the assistant to Sam Mercer on films like The Last Airbender, Devil, and Snow White and the Huntsman. Then he created his own film company and then did his short film, The Cage, which was one of my favorite short films. And since then, he's gone on to write and direct his first feature film starring Idris Elba. So he has a lot of experience that he's gained in a very short period of time since releasing The Cage in 2017 into completing Post on his first feature. So we're going to dive into all of that. And Ricky is very open and honest with all of it. And he's a lot more interesting than me. So I'm going to cut it with the intro and jump right into it with Ricky. Same place as I start with everybody. I kind of I want to know what got you. I mean, I know a little bit of your story already. And I think uh, people who watch our show know a little bit of your story because you did your amazing short film, The Cage, back in 2017, I believe it was. Was it 2017 now? Yeah. Holy crazy. God, three years. That's crazy. I know. But uh, I, w- I would love to know kind of just a, a brief overview of just what got you from point A to now the feature, your first feature that you wrote and directed uh, that we'll be talking about. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, from, I guess, 2017, it was kind of a whirlwind um, after The Cage. You know, that film, it opened a lot of doors for me into a new space, into feature films. Although, Is that actually why you did the short film? We're, we're like, uh, specifically, just go back a little bit just before The Cage. Um, I know you're doing a lot of commercials and such, right? Yeah, so, I mean, even to, I guess for people that don't give a full base of who I am as a filmmaker... I own a film production company called Neighborhood. And so primarily up until this point or up until 2017, we'd mostly done commercials or entirely had done, you know, like lifestyle branded spots. But my business partner, Dan, and I had been writing since college, like very aggressively, like almost militantly, uh, we say, as writing script after script after script. And it hit us, you know, eventually in 2016. I feel like we were on a shoot somewhere and I just looked at him. I was like, you know, this is amazing. Like we built a great company. I'm, you know, I didn't go to film school. So I felt like I was learning the craft while getting paid to do it. I, you know, at that point only been directing for a few years, but I said, you know, no one's, I just don't think anyone's going to ever watch these commercials and like give us money. I just don't think that's an actual bridge unless we, make our own stuff like the commercials i make didn't really feel reflective of my personal style and so we decided to uh start saving money to put towards a short and then that's when i wrote the cage and we shot that in the fall of 2016 not really knowing honestly what would happen with it It was more just like honestly it was a lot of me wanting to prove to myself that i could actually direct Uh, not that commercials aren't directing but even now as i've learned it's just very different than doing anything narrative and so it was really for me to know like can i take what's inside my heart and brain and mind when i'm writing these scripts and actually transition it visually and you know i'm really grateful that i had those years working on commercials leading up to it because I definitely honed my understanding of craft and how to even do that. But yeah, so then we made the cage and then it came, we released it in, I think it was like February, March of 2017. And then a lot of crazy stuff happened after that. (laughs) Do you want me to keep talking? (laughs) (laughs) I I see on your IMDb that you were uh, an assistant to Sam Mercer um, from 2010 to 2012. How how did you land that gig? And I always see, because I have a different, a little bit of a different pathway. I didn't, I didn't go through, you know, that process. I did. I was never a PA on a set or anything kind of been what has got me where I'm going. Yeah. So I always see that on, on uh, IMDb credits, you know, the assistant to what, what does that entail exactly? What was that like for you and was was that kind of because you said you didn't go to film school was that like a, a huge portion of kind of your own version of a film school yes a hundred percent actually i i always give almost all the credit to sam mercer for teaching me everything about film um so basically when i was in college i realized i wanted to i was writing a lot 
and my thought process was I don't want to sit around and wait for someone to make my scripts. So I wanted to learn how to produce. So I just started PAing, you know, offering my time on any set in any office that anyone would let me in, no matter whether they paid me or not, it didn't matter. And then I actually pretty much just hopped from PA job to PA job until eventually Sam's assistant at the time, which would have been in like 2000. Eight, I want to say, asked me if uh, I would want to be his second assistant with her. And I jumped at the opportunity. And yeah, I went in to interview with him, sat with him for like 40 minutes. And at the end of it, he was like, great, you can start next week. And I literally <laughs> remember leaving that. I actually, I went into my car. I was, his office was at Abikini. And I remember I cried. And one, because I was so excited, but two, because I had put my, like paying myself through college as a waiter, I was waiting tables and I, I remember thinking, I'm not going to have to wait tables anymore. That's amazing. <laughs> because I just like worked so hard. And this guy is, you know, if you look up Sam Mercer, I mean, he's produced yeah. films. No where, small like, name. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. He's Spielberg, Sam Mendes, and Night Shyamalan. Like, I mean, the guy is, uh, he was head of ILM for a while. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, I worked for him for, I want to say it was almost four years. I did The Last Airbender, Devil, and Snow White and the Huntsman with him before I started my company. But yeah, he, I said it before, he'd said something to me in the first interview that I did with him, he said, you know, there's going to be a lot of assistants that can fetch my dry cleaning or fetch a coffee for me. But my goal with you is for you to be able to do 40% of my job as well as I can do it so that I can go home early and be with my family. That's amazing. And so he like rigorously trained me. Uh, he was very demanding, hard boss, but he was good boss. And yeah, I, I mean, he literally, I didn't know. I lied my way through that entire interview. Like <laughs> told him I was proficient in Excel. I told him I knew all, all kinds of things. I had no clue. Uh, I went home that night and my roommate, Kevin was, he was, uh, I think he worked at an ad agency or something like literally showed me the ins and outs of every program on a computer. Like the only program I really know how to use was word or final draft. At that point. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, fake it till you make it. Yeah, totally. And yeah, so he, he he built a good base for me. I mean, one of one of the things I'd actually say, thinking about it right now, is if I think as a director, my time working for a producer was the most beneficial. Really? Yeah, because now having made a feature, I felt so equipped in that setting because it was actually I'd finally returned to a place that I started in, which is what I've learned and what I watched Sam as a producer is just movies are a huge management of people. You know, like my editor on the film I just did said the hardest part about being a director has to be that your paintbrushes are human beings. You know, like <laughs> right. I can have all these like beautiful ideas and I can have all these great, I, you know, drawings and artwork and photos, but if I can't enlist and mobilize a team of a hundred people to all make it look like that, you're, it's not going to look like that, you know, and something that I learned from Sam is he was just such a good leader and manager of time and people. And I found myself like returning to all those systems that he had taught me how to build, whether it was even calendars or how to run meetings, you know, as a director, I was able to, I don't know, fall back on a lot of my training in that regard. And it had nothing to do with like the art of it all. It yeah. was really like the management of it all. And so yeah, I feel like that would be a big piece of advice I would give to anyone that wants to be a director is go work for a producer. And something even that paid off in this is Sam was actually the first person to get on board of Concrete Cowboy. He got me the rights to the book, which was Ghetto Cowboy. And he actually started opening doors for me initially. So, it, you know, I think it would have been different had I worked for a director. Yeah. Not that directors don't want to help other directors, but it's easier for a producer if like him to go, I know how to help a director. Sure. You know? Yeah. I don't know. I think that worked out in my favor Yeah. But now that I'm, re I'm reflecting on it. So, so a lot of the stuff that you did for him was very like logistical type stuff. Yeah. So there was definitely like, you know, normal assistant based stuff like scheduling meetings. But as the years went on, I started running second units, like coordinating second units, even on airbender. I did like all the aerial units, whether they were in New Zealand or where we did, else did we did. I think we did some in Thailand and 
Greenland. Oh, it's a long time ago. But even my ability to like coordinate with those teams remotely from LA or Philadelphia is where uh, I actually shot the last airbender. And then when I went on to Snow White and the Huntsman, it was the same thing. I was just given a lot more responsibilities, putting together like visual effects breakdowns as we bid it out the jobs for that. I was involved a lot more in meetings. You know, my say had a lot more weight because I actually knew what I was talking about at that point. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and he stood by what he told me in the very beginning. Like he would, you know, <laughs> I remember him constantly leaving the office before me with like a grin on his face. And I just had like <laughs> just a pile in front of me of stuff to do. <laughs> and he'd be like, you good? I'm like, yeah, all right. Have a good night. <laughs> and it's like, but it was also, this was like some of the greatest memories of my life in my career. Like in my mind felt like I had like made it. I mean, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do and I was learning how to make films at a really high level. Yeah. With great people. So I was tired though. It was like a lot of <laughs> long, long hours. Yeah, which I mean is great conditioning for what's to come. Because I mean, I'm sure once you moved into your own company, things did not get better as far as that goes. Yeah, I mean, I honestly I felt a lot of that equipped me for the rigors of being an entrepreneur. And you know, I didn't know how to start a company. I never studied that either. But it was just like I knew how to put one foot in front of the other very carefully and methodically and patiently and build. And so, you know, a lot of uh, people don't know my company, like I, I started it so I could actually offer an apprenticeship, a training to adults returning from incarceration. And a lot of that is because I learned that throughout my career, no one had ever asked me for a resume or I never had to apply. And so if I could give an opportunity to someone that, you know, wanted an actual career who in our society isn't normally given that opportunity. But a lot of that was derived from, you know, uh, what Sam taught me when I was working on these things is that like just the grit and the work ethic and how to focus and put things together. I really loved your, uh, your Ted talk about that, which we'll put uh, a Ted talk on the the page for this. So people can find that as well. Oh, thanks, man. I thought that was really fantastic. Yeah. I hope I never have to do it again only because uh, memorize it. You have to memorize it's like 17 <laughs> minutes of memorization. Oh, so, so that's intense. like full on like a performance. Yeah, you have to do a rehearsal and everything. It's crazy. You have oh, to like wow. prove to them that you can do it. It's pretty intense. I mean, I guess I guess if uh, they wanted me to do another TED Talk, I'd probably say yes. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> it was very... I mean, I'm glad I survived it. So you, you went the assistant route. You got your company going. You did some awesome stuff there. And then you decided to go forward with the cage to kind of prove to yourself that you could direct that narrative it came out it was amazing you know we we were promoting it everywhere because i was just blown away by it i thought it was oh, terrific so after that i mean did you make that with the intention of getting attention or was was it just you know you making sure you could do the thing that you wanted to step into uh i mean it was both and obviously we were doing it as a company investment like we wanted to the bar was much lower and the fact that we just wanted to actually have this piece of work mentioned from bigger brands, bigger. I didn't actually at the time think it was going to directly lead into narrative work as specifically as it did, which I've learned why now, but I really wanted brands like, you know, Adidas or someone to see it and go, wow, that's really cool. And, you know, maybe they can do something like that for us. The, the, the irony is, is I actually, we didn't win any commercial work off the cage, which is funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think we've, there's no ROI on that. Like it was, I just think it ended up being I, my estimate is just like, you know, it's a 14 minute short film. It was like in its entirety a short, Yeah, but obviously other really amazing things came out of it after. So, but yeah, I mean, it, it was partly proving ground, but a lot of it was the shorter site was just to kind of elevate our brand of our company and try to get cooler work out of it, you know, and just expand our product. But obviously what happened after that is just, you know, we started getting attention in the narrative space, which was really exciting. So when you released it, did you start getting, um, you know, uh, emails from like producers or, or managers or agents? What, what was the next step after, you know, this kind of hit for you? You know, there was some of that, but the biggest response actually came from, you know, now that we're talking about it from people I had worked with in the industry in the past, because obviously once I made this thing, I wanted everyone who I knew to see it. And so I had sent it around to people I used to work with that knew me only as either Sam's assistant or they only knew me as a production assistant. 
or, you know, uh, for instance, one of our, our location manager on the cage who we'd worked with for a long time, she sent it to a producer, two producers, the Jeff Waxman and Jen Madeloff, who ended up, you know, they went to watch the film because Stacy sent it to her. So it was a personal, you know, email. And then they actually came down to Philly to meet with me and Dan and they ended up becoming our producers on Concrete Cowboy. And so it wasn't actually the release online. It was the right people seeing it from like the right people sending it out or like, you know, I, after I made the cage, I, you know, wanted to show it to Sam and I showed it to him and his first response was, that's incredible. I think you're ready to make a movie. And <laughs> that had to feel good. He, yes. I was, I was so nervous. I was literally shaking the whole time. Well, I, cause I actually set up like a screening for him at a co-working space near his house. And oh. I, like, oh, so and you like, sat with him while he watched it. Yes. Oh. My wife's also a producer. I knew I was, I knew I, it had gone well though, because right after, well, during I was nervous, like sick to my stomach nervous. This is a guy that I look up to, you know, yeah, like bigger than the world. But his wife was like in tears at the end. So I was like, okay, <laughs> it landed at least for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I don't even know how many like views. I think the cage maybe doesn't even have a hundred thousand views on Vimeo. It's not like it had a million views you know but it was i think the right people saw it because the right people sent it to those people you know and that that seems to be you know the consensus overall i mean mine was a little different i didn't have you know people like that really to send it to so much but ballistic is what kind of opened doors for me and it was the right people seeing it before it even i don't even think it hit 100 i mean it's done pretty well now but it's not the views online that did it. it like you said it was it was pre 100,000 definitely pre 200,000 views that i got my managers off of and got some attention from awesome. and it was just because some people had i had found out that from some of the producers that i was talking to that they have like employees that their job is they just watch short films to find, wow. you know, talent and then show that to them. So pre 200,000, 100,000, it was found by some people and then passed up to their bosses and that's how they found it. So it was pretty much a slightly different path, but the same thing of just the right people's. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, in my, at least my specific story is that people want to share good work when they find it in yeah. this industry. Like there's an energy and excitement around finding good talent. Like I, I've tried to, you know, do the same thing when I find cool stuff to send to people I know or like try to reach out to them or work with them because especially if it's personal work they made having been someone that makes commercials where the commercial doesn't necessarily reflect who you are as a storyteller yeah. or a maker you know because it's touched by so many other people like the client agency and so yeah it definitely um that was an interesting I don't know. It's like an encouragement I pass on to people. If you know, you make something and they're like, man, it only has a thousand views. I'm like, you only need one person to see it. Right. Really. That yeah. believes in you. Like you don't need a million people. I mean, I think it's cool when there's a million, but it, as I've gone on to like, you know, after we signed with our agent, we did a bunch of meetings all over town at studios and stuff. And I realized a lot of these people don't even like Sam Mercer didn't know what a Vimeo staff pick was. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I'm exactly. saying? Like they're so far removed from things that I found to be like value points mm -hmm. in my career or things that I thought would elevate me. Like while a staff pick is a beautiful, wonderful achievement and something that can open so many doors and it's a great thing to strive for. It's like certain people like him had even didn't even know what it was. Yeah. You or know? care. So it was just in, <laughs> or care. Yeah, yeah. It was really interesting. Yeah. I could, Totally relate to that too. It's like, you know, cause I have film, right. And we have a decent subscriber list and you know, we can bust out the social media numbers of all that. Look, we have a following that we can market to. No one has given the slightest shit, not the slightest, <laughs> never in a meeting. I think one time it's okay. It's come up twice, but it's only because the, you know, I was talking to creative execs who actually happened to have watched film right when they were younger they came up watching film right and and so they were like oh i know i know you and i know the channel yeah that's the only reason and that was it that was the end of the conversation i i thought for sure that that would be this like oh this is gonna help this will be helpful and so far no one has cared it has <laughs> no. nothing to do with it it's it's like it's weirdly um like when i had that conversation with sam it was 
actually very comforting to me because I, I realized I had found a lot of my identity in like trying to be like chasing Vimeo all stars. Right. Yeah. And then to, to realize this guy that I looked up to who was making films that I wanted to make didn't have a clue who these people were or what a staff <laughs> pick was, was actually relaxing to me. Cause at this point when I'm talking to him in this conversation, I'm thinking about, I hadn't actually made the cage yet. I was just talking to him about how to leap in the features and the world kind of opened up for me. I was like, I always say I could have been a teacher in Kansas and made the cage and probably still been afforded the same exact opportunities. Yeah, I think so. Kind of a, a somewhat of a mentor to me way back in the day when I was like first starting film right and all that said, you know, just focus on the content because the cream rises to the top. Don't yeah. don't chase what you think is going to get attention because whatever that is today won't be the same thing tomorrow. Just focus on doing what you love, what you're passionate about, and the cream will rise to the top. And and I've kind of aimed my entire career at that, and yeah. it's definitely served me. Yeah, I mean, it kind of feels like even listening to you, like we're coming out of a time and space where views or likes used to be God, you know, yeah. like, yeah. and we're starting to realize that it's just kind of mundane at this point. Like, you know, maybe it got a lot, maybe it didn't. I don't, you know, like... At least for me, when I went on all these meetings, I realized that people were responding to the cage not because of how many views it had. They were responding to it because of the piece of work it was. And yeah. I think they're also responding to it, actually paying attention to it because of the people that sent it to them. You know, like we're so flooded now by content and where to get it that at least for me, I think it was because of having, you know, like Stacy, who was my location manager and ended up being a producer on Concrete Cowboy. Like she sent it to Jeff Waxman and she even told me a story when she sent him the cage the first time he wrote back nice and she <laughs> called him and said, you're, you didn't watch the film. And he's like, yes, yeah, I did. He goes, Jeez, you didn't watch it because you can't watch the cage and say it was nice. And he's like, okay. He's like, I was on a plane and I tried to watch it and it wouldn't load. And I just forgot, you know, and that could have been the end of it right there. But she's like, please, when you get home, watch this film. And he watched it. And his response was he called her and literally that day drove to Philly to meet with me and Dan. Wow. Him and his producing partner, Jen, took us to lunch. And these are guys, they were in the middle of shooting Vice and – they're you know other huge amazing producers and we're just really more like we want to do something with you guys but if i if stacy hadn't like pushed him to actually engage it it would have been a you know would have never happened and you know that is amazing that's a guy i hope that, you sent her like a 18 year bottle of something oh she's like she's my person like she's she was a producer on concrete cowboy she'll probably be a producer on everything i ever make forever yeah, she's incredible. They drove up to meet with you based off of the cage. So what was that meeting like? They just, what came of that specifically? Well, what was good is that, you know, I guess would be another really solid piece of advice is we were like prepared for the success. You know, Dan and I had been writing so much that we actually had one script that we're still trying to make with them that was finished. And then we actually had uh, what was then called Ghetto Cowboy, which so at that point, when I met them, Sam had gotten me the rights to the book. But Sam at that point was like, the most I'll be able to do is open doors for you. And I can, you know, he got his attorneys to put the deal together. And so we, I had put together this pretty elaborate treatment around Ghetto Cowboy, like the visuals, why the story was important. You know, I'd been at that point, spent a lot of time with the Cowboys. They're right next to our office in North Philly. And so... I mean, everyone's question after they see the film is like, what do you guys want to do? What's next? Yeah. And so we actually had like a portfolio of stuff like, well, here's this, here's this, really want to do this. And so, you know, they jumped on and they're like, we're in for it all. Let's, let's make this happen. So did you, did you have a draft of the script? Did you say of Concrete Cowboys or you just had the general, like the treatment in the book? At that point, we did not, I, I don't think we had the script yet or we are working on it. I can't remember, to be honest. It was in process, though, for sure. And did they did they jump on that specifically? Like con at that moment, they were like, "Yes, Concrete Cowboys, let's yeah. figure that out." Yeah, I mean, Je Jeff and Jen are amazing. They're like, "We're going to produce everything you ever make from here on out." Like, <laughs> they're the beautiful, wonderful, amazing people that have I owe a lot to what has happened since because of them. Which is like another, you know, if you're a filmmaker out there, really 
I think having producers that believe in you is so essential and that have access and resource and are senior to you, I think has been game changing. I feel very grateful to have met them, but yeah, they were basic, like we're in for it all. <laughs> so <laughs> that's amazing. So what was the next step for that? So you already had the rights to the book when you talked to them. So then did you and Dan just dive straight into getting a draft done at that point? So at this point, when we met them, it was like in the summer of 2017 and we were getting a lot of reach outs from agents and managers and you know what's interesting even that and now I'm, it's like hitting me some of the other agents that we didn't end up signing with that we really liked were also personal like people had emailed their agents it wasn't actually because of the festivals oh wow yeah so is that how you actually got your agents is because people were just sending the the cage to their agents yeah so well the, so the agent we sent ended up signing with is at wme his name is rich cook and Jeff and Jen were working on Vice with Adam McKay, and Adam McKay's agent is Rich Cook. And Jeff showed Adam the short, and Adam's like, "You need to show this to Rich Cook." And then I could, we got this like <laughs> great email from him, and we ended up going in to meet. And we knew Dan and I knew right away this was like our guy. He like totally understood yeah. that we were makers that we wanted to build things and not just get scripts sent to us to make. And we had two scripts at that time, one of them being Ghetto Cowboy that were finished. So I actually think we did have the script because we basically, he said, he's like, what do you guys want to do? And we were like, well, here we got this, we got this, we want to make this, we want to get like this book. (laughs) We came in with like a whole vision of where we wanted our career to go. And yeah, so it was again, it was Jeff and Jen, hooking us up and reaching out on our behalf, you know? Yeah. And it's the same, like you said, you have managers, right? Do you yeah. have an agent too? No, no, no agent yet. Just manager. So I don't have a manager. We just have an agent. And I think it just depends. But even then having Rich send our work out and around, obviously it's part of like his main job when he signs us. But, you know, learning as we met with executives or production companies, how they watched it because Rich sent it to them. Like, you know, Rich has great taste. So we know if he sends us something, we got to watch it. We're not going to ignore it. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it was a, definitely a lesson. And we said no to a lot of opportunities that were coming before us. Like the first agents and the first wave of managers, we so almost like just wanted to sign with because you're just so excited. It's actually Sam who told me this. He said that, I'm trying to think how exactly I said, oh, he said, they'll wait for you. He said, they'll tell you that you have to sign now, but they're lying. They'll wait for you. He's like, they'll wait a year for you. He's like, don't make them wait that long. He's like, but give it three, four, five months before you sign with someone. And I'm really glad that we took that advice because we ended up, we didn't end up meeting Rich until like three or four months into like meetings with agents and managers. Right. And it makes my stomach turn thinking about not signing with him, how great it's been being signed with him yeah and there there i'm sure there was a factor of like will this window close at some time should i just grab onto it a hundred percent i thought we had somehow gypped the system because i was like in no way am i a well-known enough director to even be getting meetings with these types of managers and agents like they're gonna realize that like my body of work literally starts and stops at the cage <laughs> <Right>. so <laughs> i was like i like we need to just like pick someone and it was sam like talking me off the ledge like you just be patient patience you don't want to rush this moment and i'm just so grateful i listened to him because it felt like we needed to just pick someone yeah so yeah well moving into actually writing concrete cowboy you were adapting that what what was that process like did you kind of kick drafts back and forth yeah so dan and i actually have a really unique writing process which i guess maybe be helpful for other writing partners out there so what we've done basically since college is you know we steal things from the internet we've taken some classes whether it's like different structure pieces or things but with any story we actually always start with this book called save the cat probably well known to most writers yeah. writers if not get known to it it's it's seemingly like a very um on the outside seems like a generic high level breakdown of the different types of stories but dan and i have always found it valuable to for it to help hone like okay what kind of story is this and then what are the rules to that story dan and i are big fans of structure and so we do that and then even with the book 
obviously we read it, we talked to the author, but the biggest thing is we took it. There's two specific cowboys from the community in North Philly that read the book with us. And then we said, okay, what of this book is you guys and what needs to dive deeper? Like now that we're making a movie, what needs to be pulled out and what needs to be more articulated? And so that was even something that the author, Greg Neary, we told him was kind of our take on the book was going to be is like kind of elevating it into this more mature space, really letting the cowboy community own its narrative, which he was all for. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, we spent probably almost, I think it was nine months to a year, just spending time down there. And then we would sit with the two cowboys, Eric and Mill, and they would, uh, we would record stories of theirs. So we're like, you know, tell us about what it's like in your world to break a horse or tell us how you buy the horses. So all these components from the script that we knew were going to be involved, they would walk us through and just tell us. We had, I think, almost 20 hours worth of interviews. And so that gave us a handle on how they talk, how they say things, their slang. And then when we when we actually went to write, we just break out the the script into like beats, essentially like every scene of the movie. And we actually go to a four act structure. So we actually break the, the script into four acts. For anyone who doesn't know, could you kind of describe how you see four acts? Yes. So a script is broken down into, you know, a three act structure where there's, if it's 120 pages is what they use, then the first 30 is act one, 60 pages is act two and act three is 30 pages. The problem that we always had is, which is the problem with a lot of scripts, is that middle space. Yeah, really feels really long. That giant like desert to cross, like it's, like it's dying. Yeah, and so I can't remember. I have all these documents. I should have pulled them up, but we've like basically mixed and matched different structures from different writers and different books, and you know we're big readers. And essentially what we do is, first of all, we, we, our goal is to always keep our scripts under a hundred pages. So we shrunk the page count because I've learned it's the first thing people look at executives, anyone who's reading your script, if they see it's actually 120 pages, there's this feeling of, uh, but yeah. if it's 99, if it's 99 pages, even when I think of it now, I go, I can do that. I can do that right now. Mm -hmm. I'll read that right now. The first draft of my uh, script that I delivered was like 130 something. <laughs> and they were like, nope. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So right off the bat, our goal is to keep it under a hundred pages. And then we break down it into four acts where I don't know what the math is. It's like 23 or 24 pages, whatever. But let's say it's just 25 for cleaner math. But basically each act is the same length at that point. So there's yeah. one, two, three, and four. And then there's different, basically mile markers have to hit within each act so that the movie is basically constantly twisting and turning where I think a lot of scripts, they twist and turn in the beginning and then they just flatline in the middle because I think the mile markers are too far apart. Yeah. So there's not enough stuff happening immediately to the characters. Cause I, I know one of the compliments we get on every single one of our scripts is that people say like, I literally just couldn't stop turning the page. That's great. It gets read so fast. That's what you need. And man. I think a lot of that, a lot of that is, I think, like I think we're good writers. Otherwise I wouldn't be sacrificing so much of my life for this, but I, I honestly think the structure plays a huge role in achieving that. Cause it actually keeps us like honest to like, why is the scene in there? And then the other thing that changed after the cage was Dan and I, when we press down on the script, we say, do I want to wake up and shoot this scene when it comes down to it? And cause I started saying that off the cuff to Dan like we would write a scene and I'd be like, I just, it doesn't get me excited as a director to direct that scene. And Dan was like, well, then we probably shouldn't write it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's probably not gonna be fun to watch either if, if you don't even want to make it. And so that ended up being another litmus test of like, well, why isn't the scene working? Like what is, why is the energy not there? Like what is bad about it? Yeah. And so that was like a really helpful device as I became a director. It was like, okay, I don't want to wake up and shoot this sunrise because I know I'm going to have to wake up at four in the morning for this seemingly nonsensical scene that will eventually just get cut. Right. So. Yeah. And that's a great way of thinking in a project, just like a surgeon cutting out all the bad pieces. Yeah. And, and do it at the script level. Like I have, when I was working for Sam, I watched a lot of the process where I was like, 
these problems could have been managed level when all you have to do is delete words. I've read a lot of scripts too. And a lot of the movies that I love, the script is really great too. There's like a correlation. The script is awesome. The margin of error on the making of the film is much smaller. Like very rarely, at least in my limited experience, have I read a script and then seen the movie and been like, wow, they really screwed that up. I just don't, it's not, it's, it's a lot harder to do in my opinion if you put the effort in at the script level. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just have so much more time to focus in on the right things in pre-production than you do in the chaos of production. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of, you know, like making my first movie, I defended that a lot. Like people being like, we'll just figure it out or we'll just see what happens. I'm like, no, 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 no. This doesn't work right now at the script phase. So we're going to figure it out right now. That's great. Man. While we still have three weeks before we're shooting. Cause I'm telling you, wedging in that type of idea is going to it's going to topple the house of cards here it's like and you know dan and i would even it was like we were literally in pre-production on the movie and we'd still be like we'd lock ourselves away and write a scene and still trying to make the action lines feel really strong and everything even though like the movie's getting made like you don't have to polish it that much <laughs> but it was like i literally couldn't let myself have the script have holes in it yeah like it had to be tight <laughs> that's smart man uh, really yeah. smart when did uh idris elba come in into play with this so he came on the scene in so let me think here so we signed with our agent rich and i think it was like the fall of 2000 i want to say 17 which is when we did the cage and then for the first year we were actually working on a different project uh, putting together a different project and then I think it was, so when did we made the cage in 2019? So 2018, it was, I think it was like the spring of 2018. I think Rich was in a meeting with Idris or heard about this. I don't know. Idris had expressed his team. Idris is also signed at William Morris, which another piece of advice for any new filmmaker, like I think from a filmmaker standpoint, wh where you sign is really important because I have found being signed at WME I have way more immediate access to the talent there than CAA or UTA. Yeah. Like there's barriers. I know that's a huge reason a lot of managers have told me it's good to have a manager. There's just this weird, like, you know, you can get to those other agencies, but like, you know, Idris is at, is at WME and in this meeting, he expressed to his team a desire to, he wanted to star in and produce a film that was uplifting to the black community is how it was described to me and so my agent pulled him into his office was like i have the script for you <laughs> and he pitched him ghetto cowboy and it's kind of like out of a movie it just read it on a flight home to london and then when he landed he's like i want to talk to those guys and so we ended up i sat i remember i was like <laughs> on vacation somewhere in san diego and i had to go like park in my car somewhere to get away from the screaming kids <laughs> 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 like talk to idris elba on the phone and yeah dan and i talked to him and he has a production company called green door and his executives are just amazing actually and yeah we like chopped it up talked about my story as a director why i made this film why i want to make it and at the end he's like i'm in you know oh, let's do it and it was like a whole another year of battles just to get to actually shooting it. But yeah, getting him attached was obviously like a very exciting moment in my life. Yeah. I, I can't even imagine. Was it that, that call with him to sort of get him on board? What was that like? Was he just wanting to know your take on the material? Yeah. So as it was described, the term to us is that he was leaning into it. Like he was interested. The script had really moved him. There's definitely that element as a director where you need to really be able to express yourself in meetings, even over the phone. That was my shot to basically win him over. And being able to pitch and sell and describe why this is meaningful. You know, if you're not a good public speaker, start take, take classes. I would. Yeah. Because honestly, I feel like a lot of meetings, we've won them in the room presentations, just like public speaking. Dan and I always joke, we have like a our own little uh, two act play that we put on, like, here's how I started. And here's how I started. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we've got it down to a, like a science because it's so important. Like these actors have 
such limited availability that I've learned. And they're really, you know, for a first time director, someone like Idris Elba was taking a massive risk on me. And, you know, at any moment, if you, at least in my opinion, give any sense that you're not capable, they just will pull the plug. It's like, nah, I'm not going to do it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it was, a, it was like months after that call. I think it was like four or five months when they finally, we decided to do like a press release. And that was like a crazy moment in my life where I like, I remember getting like a text or something from my agent that the article was on variety. I was like <laughs> so sitting crazy. in a coffee shop, sitting in a coffee shop with Dan. And I was like, Oh my God, it's actually real now. And like you can't put something like this out and not actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> like e even after that call and even after I knew he was like going to do it, I kept thinking like, eventually it's not going to happen. Like, <laughs> yeah. Eventually I'm a big self doubter. I realize. Yeah. At like, some <laughs> point I wake up at some point he realizes like this movie is not for him. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And then I think it was maybe Idris's like agent, like emails. I, it doesn't matter. I was just like, I saw the email with the link. They're like, it's up. I was like, what? Oh my God. <laughs> That's great. Did he have a well, lot to say uh, about the script? Like, was there a lot of script changes after he was on board? I wouldn't even say there were like changes. Like actually the biggest compliment to him and his executives were, they never asked Dan and I to make a change, but what they did is we sat with them for, I want to say almost like a full day. And they just like pressed down on the script, like asked us questions and why would they do this? Or why do they say this or whatever? And it actually just ended up, we ended up realizing like, Oh, that doesn't really make sense. Or this doesn't really make sense. Or like that should be stronger. It was one of the like most eloquent, respectful ways I've ever seen anyone go about quote unquote giving notes. Like I wouldn't even call it giving notes. His execs are these women, Anna and Emma, and they were just, just so respectful of the actual script and our process making it and us as writers. Like they never tried to take that out of our hands. I don't know. It's just, it's really, I'm, I know that there's way worse scenarios like in yeah. classic Hollywood, but my, my first experience did not go that way. And I, I do, I give a lot. Of, I think it just put together a really compassionate, strong team around him. And he's also a very thoughtful person I've learned. So brought other people like that around him, which I appreciate, you know, I mean, it makes sense. Now I think about it, like he's taking a shot on the, I've never directed a movie yeah. and it's like low, like very almost no budget. You know, the, the guy's doing like making piles of money on, <laughs> yeah. you know, Hobbs and Shaw. Like you don't need to do this movie. <laughs> yeah. He's no small actor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, But moving into um, the film itself and directing your first feature, I, I'm sure you learned a ton. Were there specific things that stood out that maybe, you weren't expecting or that just solidified things that you thought or saw as a director? Yeah. I mean, the thing that uh, it's the first thing that came to mind when you asked the question was I didn't realize how much I would have to defend the story, not in a negative sense, but the physical and mental fatigue was so much more intense than I could have ever imagined. Being in a position then as the leader of all of it, it was just the weight of that realization and the first the fact that it's my first time so every situation is new to me not giving in to just like someone else sees something differently or someone else does something not the way that i wanted the the temptation to just let it go like be like eh, whatever it's good enough you know i feel you know whether people love the movie or don't love the movie i feel like i didn't compromise at any portion and it was very grueling and tiring and i yeah. couldn't have done it without people like dan and stacy and jeff and jen supporting like literally holding me up and you know like calling me to action to not give up and you know they also were also you know working that hard and and, and i found that people like i you know come to mind like my line of producer her name is also jen like when I could see how vigilantly she was fighting for a vision of mine, it like gave me renewed energy. I was like, okay, there's someone else here in this room that also cares as much as me. Like yeah. that, that was a big thing is try to find the people that, you know, care about the movie as much as you, which there'll be few of them. Like I just named a handful of people. Most people it's, they're not doing it on purpose. They just, it's not their film, you know, like they could be super talented. They could be, 
kind and generous, but at the end of the day, you know, they need to get home to their kids or they have other stresses or they do this or they make mistakes because they're humans. You know, it's like, yeah. but I, I started to realize I was like this, I have to be vigorous at every level. I can't let up. And so, you know, if something wasn't exactly how I wanted it, I wasn't crazy or obnoxious about it, but I was just very like diligent to go, no, I need it to be a hundred percent this way. Yeah. And here's why. And, and then also there's people that would surprise the shit out of me and make something just 10 times better than I ever dreamed. And your ability, at least for me, if you're like, I'm very aware of my pride in all circumstances is to recognize when your idea isn't the best and uplift it. I don't know why there's this temptation to feel like, no, I, as the director have to have all the great ideas. But like something that I got addicted to is like unleashing people's ability to be better than me. It was yeah. like I, I started joking around set. It was like, it's great. If you're amazing, I'm gonna get all the credit as the director. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean it's a great it's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I was trying to like break down these patterns that I had recognized as an assistant where directors like hoard power and want to hoard greatness at the expense of other people's greatness. Yeah. Versus being like, dude. It's a, it's terrible how it works. Like, like people think that the director literally what does everything, like they get all the glory and all the blame, but I'm like, if everyone is working at their like most healthy, optimal level, it is a great thing for the director. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You're a conductor so, of the orchestra, but it's such a weird thing to say. It's so like right now I'm rested. I'm, you know, we're literally in quarantine and yeah. I'm like taking naps and stuff. But like <laughs> when, you're in the middle of it and you're so fatigued. It's weird how you're like ego, like you just want to be praised to get some shallow satisfaction. And it's, I, I started to, I started to see too, like how this business has created monsters. Like the, I just, the fatigue was crazy to me, like the mental and physical fatigue, but to like really, you know, encourage people like when you're in that moment, it's like, okay, find the brilliant people, find the loving people, lift them up. Even like, let everyone know their idea is better than yours. Go with it. But then in the same, right, if their idea isn't, like, you know your gut, you got to, like, put your foot down. Don't be too tired to just let the, you know, B-team idea get through. How many days did you uh, shoot? Uh, we shot for 20 days. Ooh, that's fast. <laughs> it was a breakneck experience. <laughs> how many How many hours a day? Well, it varied. I mean, some days we went to overtime. I think we were trying to do 10 to 12, like, consistently. Unfortunately, there were a couple days where if if there's a, a lightning storm, you can't shoot inside or outside per the union. So there was, I think, three days where we lost half a day. And that didn't mean I got more days. It means I just had to make it up on other days. Eesh. So it was pretty rough. But that was like another thing where I was very fortunate. Like someone like Idris ended up giving us like an extra day in his schedule because we were just getting screwed and he's like don't let's we'll figure it out let's do it you know the crew was obviously saw what was happening but there were you know it was they were what was hard about the schedule is even if every day was beautiful and sunny and perfect it was already going to be blistering so when like things with that would hit you're just like oh my god (laughs) like i've been sitting in this holding area for four hours just watching the clock run yeah because we can't shoot oh my gosh so yeah there's crazy. I mean, some scenes we shot like four or five pages in like an hour. It's insane. <laughs> yeah. Do you, so, did you have more multiple cameras on that or were you a single cam show? No, we were, we shot uh, with two cameras. I think we tried to do one camera the first like day or two and realized it was a terrible idea. What about working with Idris Elba? Was this the first time you had worked with a major actor at this point? Def- yeah, for sure. How did you find um, kind of finding your way into that? By the time you got on set, did you already have a rapport there to where it just fell right into it? I mean, there was like, you know, we had met up for like meals and meetings and a couple times and had some phone conversations. But because of his schedule and where and how we needed to shoot, we actually didn't get to do any rehearsals. We didn't get to do like a, a read through. We didn't get any of like any of that time like the first time i saw him on set was for his first scene so that was a little intense (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but it was like uh my suggestion if you can is not that you should have any lesser scenes but i'm really thankful to my ad like the scenes that he was in where less was required of him 
So he, Idris was able to like kind of find his voice as this character. And I was also able to find my voice as a director directing Idris Elba because I was like insanely nervous yeah. and freaked out by like, this is actually happening in my life right now. <laughs> yeah. And with someone of his caliber, that just, that just seems so terrifying. Yeah. And, and, and even him, but like also, you know, Caleb McLaughlin is, you know, also yeah. like a pretty bit is like him. And then Jarrell Jerome was on the first day too. And then, you know, Lee Daniels is one of our producers was on set the first day. I was, I was, I was terrified. It's like, this is so, I was like any good athlete. It's like, you just, I got onto the field and I just started, I was like, all right, I'm just going to do my thing. And thankfully it worked out. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that first day is always, even if they're not famous people on set. I mean, it was the same way with the cage. I was terrified and freaked out. And Yeah. I, I always find myself, I mean, obviously I've not done <laughs> that, in that level, Idris and, <laughs> and Lee Daniels and all that, but I always find myself headed to set, like something in the back of my mind telling me like, no, let's just go back to the hotel. Yeah, let's just go to a safe space. Yeah, I mean, let's not that, do this. <laughs> to me, that's writing. Like, I think writing is the most cozy, safe, invincible place. Like, you pour your heart out on the page, and you don't even have to be there when someone reads it. Totally. Yeah. And if they don't like it, the worst thing you get is like a rejection email, which you can just delete, <laughs> bury in your heart, and file away. <laughs> tell everybody else that they said something nicer. <laughs> yeah, or just like not tell people. <laughs> yeah, you totally. Know? It's like I never send it to anyone, but like the the public display of it's just uh, it's very intense. Yeah, just like you said, like a hundred people just looking at you to uh, okay, now what? And then you have yeah, to have an answer. Yeah, my aunt, she was a producer back in the day, and she said that directing is like being pecked to death by a hundred ducks. <laughs> <laughs> I said that was, she told me that in the beginning. At the end, I was like, "Yeah, that is accurate." It's like <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. What is if like you don't mind talking about it? Uh, what what kind of what did you find your process was with Idris as a director actor? Like what was that relationship? What kind of things would you talk about to kind of shift him in different ways? You know, I, um, it's interesting. I thought, you know, I did that thing with you actually about how to like teach non-actors and stuff like that, or yeah. how to, how to direct non-actors. I thought my style would change substantially when I started working with someone of like Idris's caliber and to a lot of degrees it, I didn't have to go through such extended length sometimes to like convey like what I felt like the scene needed to be. But in some regards, like I found that those actors responded to my energy if the scene required it or quietness, like my embodiment of the energy they needed. I felt at least as they expressed to me, it was they enjoyed as an actor. Also, you know, half the cast was also non-actors. So I brought that into this too, but I would spend a lot of time. Like uh, there's this um, like moment on set when I was, you know, again, listening to people. I think, I think listening is probably the biggest thing as a director I learned especially your actors like expect your actors to know the characters better than you even though you created them there's this moment on set where i was telling idris talking through how he should be and he was actually like i don't think that's how he'd be anymore as a dad and we were like kind of having it out and i realized in the moment i was wrong like i had lost my way a little bit in the story and he was actually challenging me I was like, you know what? You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Just ignore me. <laughs> you do you. <laughs> um, but it was like, we had this helpful rhythm that I had with all the actors where we would just like talk it out all the time. Like, what are we feeling? What is happening here? Why is this? What happened before this? Constantly keeping in context. But it was the first time where I realized like it was possible for me, the creator of this story who had lived with it for three years to lose my way as well. Like I had lost where I was in this world. And I was really grateful. Like when I watched the film and I see this scene, I'm like, the dude freaking saved me. He saved, he like is so beautiful. Like he, he's just so smart, you know? And I think something I've learned of actors at that level that I didn't have on like the cage is they're just, they're at that level for a reason. Like they're yeah. just so, so talented. Was there ever a time where you remain thinking you were right on, on something that, they felt strongly uh, the opposite with and, and how did you, if there was, how did you resolve that? We do it both ways. That that's was always my like, can you trust me and I'll trust you. Um, 
because to me, I was like, there's no reason for us to pick one way. Yeah. Like I would, I would love to have both amazing versions of this performance emotionally different when I get to the edit. Like that sounds like a delicious buffet to eat off of <laughs> like versus like a buffet of all the same food, you know, like that is something I learned in post was I was glad when like I would have those conversations with like Jarrell a lot where he would see things differently and I would just like let him vibe and flow. And like, then I would be like, do it this way. Like I can literally sculpt the scene three different ways, which ended up being so helpful because what I didn't realize ever having gone through this is how in post that's like a whole nother rewrite of the movie. Like you're making the movie all over again. It's like now totally different than you imagined, almost totally different than you wrote, but you just have all these pieces. And it was a real luxury to have done it that way with these actors to like, you know, give me different versions. Like something I actually, I learned and I stole from Adam McKay when we got to be on the set of vice, I heard him say it during scenes, he's like, all right, we're going to do a couple just for you guys. He would just let his actors just do whatever the hell they wanted. Oh, that's great. And when you have Christian Bale and Amy Adams and Steve Carell, I mean, it was like, oh my God, it's like cheating. So <laughs> we would do scenes all the time where I was just like, you know what? Let's just, you guys just do it. Just do it however you want. Let's just see what happens. And a lot of times it was pretty amazing. Was that like sort of a, we got the plan. Yeah. Now let's add a little. Well, or we've gotten, like, I've gotten a version of the scene that I think is really strong, but let's see if there's actually something that we can mine out of it that's stronger. That's great. And so, yeah, that was, you know, I've, I haven't had a lot of luxuries to watch other directors work. And so when I was on set that one day and heard him say that, I was like, God, that's so smart. Like, why? You have these, like, the best actors in the world all sitting in the same room acting, like, of course they're probably going to do something incredible yeah. and what's the harm if they don't like, but how many times in post we stole a line or a scene or a look or a moment that was not something I came up with. And so it's like, if I can, if I can give everyone actors crew a moment to have a lightning in a bottle, that's a good outcome for me. Well, you, you, you did the short film in the, and the feature pretty close together. I mean, the, the, the short was 2017 and you shot the feature in 2019. That's only a two year span, which is really fast. And given how quick, you know, those two things were, were you able to kind of see the contrast between those two projects, that short film and the feature? That's something that just, I'm constantly wondering what, when you get to the feature level and you have these, you know, these people, they do this, you know, people like Idris, yeah. the producers you had on there. It, did it feel much different directing that level of project that's even much longer than it did the short or just, did it just feel longer? I think it feeling longer is actually what made it so different. You know, when we made The Cage, I had already come out of making features. A lot of my company are people that worked on features so we ran, you know, anyone that was on that set would know it was run like a feature. It just only took six days, but it was the same essential scale. But the difference was how do you do it? Like, I think 20 days was so is previous to shooting for 20 days was thought it was so fast. But I remember having a moment the second week of shooting thinking, I don't know if I could actually physically make it to the end of 20 days. Wow. Like I'm not, I'm not even kidding. It was, I was so exhausted because you're, you're shooting these incredibly long hours Monday through Friday, but then I'm prepping on Saturday and Sunday. Like I would sit for almost six, seven, eight hours with my AD and DP on a Sunday. We would, <laughs> we go to the place that had like a brunch buffet, start early. And we were laying out every shot for the whole upcoming week. And we would work through lunch, like in this back room. Yeah. And so you're not like, I didn't, you don't rest. And it's so hard to mentally rest because you're processing what you already did. And then you're also processing what's to come. And you're just so tired. Like one of the best pieces of advice that I thought was funny at first and then I actually took it to heart thankfully because my wife was like that is a great piece of advice was this other producer not on the movie she told me she's like make sure you get a massage every Saturday morning the first thing you do it will like, <laughs> right? rejuvenate you got a massage every weekend like it would get two hour and it was like a literally like rehabilitating putting my body back together 
And I was like, there's no way I'm getting a massage. That's so extravagant. Like, blah, blah, blah. But my wife was all about it. I think massages are awesome. So I was like, okay. But I never had massages as like a physical rehabilitation. <laughs> right. Like, cause I don't like, I don't sit down when I direct. So I like, I didn't even have a director's chair. I told them take it out of the budget. It's like a waste of time. Cause I, I also knew that like, you know, locations has to move all these villages and chairs and it's like one less station they got to build. So I'm just like on my feet, crouching, crawling, you know, operating. Like I just, my body felt, I felt like an old man. <laughs> Did you operate a lot on this? Um, not, no, not a lot. Uh, there's just a few, like a handful of scenes or moments that I just felt I wanted it was just easier if I did it, but what usually leads you to that decision of, you know, I want to operate this. Is it just a moment where the camera feels that much of like a character to you? Yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it. Like I, it's just like an instinct I get where I'm like, I don't, I'm also in probably like a flurry. I'm thinking about the few times where I did it, where I was trying to not operate. And eventually I was just like, you know what, let me get behind the wheel. Like I just, I can just do this really fast and work. You don't have to time and I'll just bang it out. Yeah. And then there are other times where like we have a similar, like in the cage, there's this scene where they're running and there's a similar chase sequence in concrete cowboy. And I had operated the cage thing, but to run with like a, I don't know how heavy that camera is like 40 or 50 pounds, but literally like dead sprinting with it, just pointing behind my back. Like Minko, my TP is like, this is all you, man. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I have absolutely no desire to dead sprint. There's a hundred yard dash through an alleyway right. multiple times. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this because I'm the one who wants it. So I'll handle it. And yeah, that was, that was like a, a backbreaker for sure. <laughs> do you find yourself when you're not operating, do you find yourself like near the camera or at a monitor usually? So I actually, I, I go with, um, I have my own monitor that I sling over my shoulder that I, I constantly have. It's almost like a, um, I just sling it over my back when I'm not using it. And then I sling it around to my chest when I use it, almost like a sash. And then that way I always have a monitor that's just for me that no one else, like maybe my AD will look at it. Cause I like to be really close with the actors and in the scene. Yeah. So it also keeps me away from. I get really distracted if I'm at like village or somewhere because I'm just aware. I'm like, okay, I'm directing, but Lee Daniels is literally sitting next to me. Like, and then there's like always like director. whispers somewhere. That oh yeah. There's pull whispers. You away. They're texting. I'm like, is the scene not good? Cause you're like on your phone. <laughs> yeah. Like I, you know, it's like, I just, I like to be immersed in the actual world where I'm at. So that I can like, it's just the disconnect is too hard for me to be not physically in the actual space. Yeah. So that's the setup that I roll with. And it's great. Like I can toggle both cameras. I can have it split screen on my monitor for a director that's really tactical and like wants to be in the moment. It's a great setup. Do you find yourself cutting a lot? Like within a scene, do you see just, do you, did you reset a lot without ever cutting to keep momentum or would you like cut and then, you know, sit and talk it out and then roll again? Uh, I hate cutting. I think it's such a momentum killer. The other thing I realized too, is when you cut, everyone every department thinks they can flood in and like do touch ups oh man so, <laughs> so true so i learned that if you don't cut everyone stays back so it's like i would always just be like okay hey, we're still rolling we're still rolling i would give new direction i'd reset and then we just go again and then i actually think i would do this now that i, I can fully say it cuz i've gone through it is i would tail slate every take if i could because when you slate at the beginning, sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, here's the moment. Uh, the clouds are perfect, or this is right. And they're like, okay, uh, roll in. Like, it's like all this shit has to happen. Like their clappers are, and it takes like 40 seconds, and now the moment's gone. Yeah, man. If I could do away with slates altogether, I would. And you can technically, yeah. but you know, people are probably going to like rage in the comments. <laughs> totally. <when> they're like, <laughs> this awful director does not know what he's talking yeah. about. Yeah. There's so many technical things like that that it's just like we need a better way. Yeah, I, and I think if you, I will do this on the next one. I would, I would tail slate because you still get the information within the clip. There's information like built into the clip. It all gets logged. There's so many beautiful, yeah. wonderful editors logging and coding everything. I mean, the organization is at a level that's just unbelievably amazing, and to ruin moments or like you know the actors literally like 
got himself into like, you know, I'm just thinking moments like Caleb's like weeping and all of a sudden everyone's flooding in clapping. I'm like, dude, just yeah. hit record. Like we'll do all this at the end. You know, Man, that's a great, that's a great piece of advice. Actually. I, I, I love that. I would. Yeah. And then, you know, it's just, you got to pick your battles. Like I, you know, you do need to listen to those things. So you don't want to screw yourself. And, yeah. but that is one that you, everyone should do. And my other big piece of advice that I am a big proponent of is not, allowing cell phones on set like on the actual set you can go off and do whatever but i mandated a hardcore do not pull out your phone the only people that were allowed to were people doing like continuity looks with makeup and wardrobe but like the thing i get so bothered when i see people doing instagram stories or take pictures on set or the amount of insecurity that that brings to me it just completely makes a dysfunctional creative environment because you're asking everyone to play pretend to literally be like little kids. And now everyone's critiquing it by taking pictures of it or texting about it. Or, you know, I, I remember uh, when I was in high school, I would do plays. And I remember this director would always tell us if we were sitting in the audience during rehearsals, we were never allowed to talk. And he was, he was a, a, a military guy. So he was really intense and he would scream at us. And so we had to sit there silent. And when I was in high school, we didn't have smartphones. But what he was saying is when you're on stage and you hear someone in the audience whispering, your first gut assumption is they're whispering about you. Yeah. Even though you could be talking about whatever. And I think the same rule applies on set is you're asking all of us to create this imaginary world. And we know now how prolific social media is and actors that get called out for being this or that, you know, because someone filmed them on set. I was like, I didn't even want the actual like that it was possible to happen. And I think it's actually just genuinely a distraction. Like I, how many times I would reach for my pocket in between takes and I'm like to check what, like yes. what could possibly be more important than me making my first movie. And yeah. So, it's just the addiction of the thing. It is an addiction. And so I actually, my assistant had my cell phone all day. And the only time I would turn it on even was to call my wife at lunch to check in how she was doing. And otherwise she knew, to call Dan if there was an emergency. And that's great. And dude, the, the amount of anxiety that left my physical body was amazing. Like the amount of daydreaming I did, like when we would go scouting and inevitably everyone's on their phone and I'm just like, I didn't even physically have access to my phone. I really just daydream. And I would like, man, maybe we should shoot it like that. Or like, Whoa, what was that block over there? Like, Hey driver, turn around. I want to go see that street. Yeah. And how many things I would miss because I was like, looking at Instagram and did people like my picture, like stupid shit that literally has <laughs> yes. absolutely no, no value. That is the truest thing. Like what you just said, it's just, it's meaningless things. It's, uh, you know, invisible likes and, uh, <laughs> thumbs up to, for what, to what end the thing I realized like at this level of that very few directors or writers that I look up to now that are, have careers that I really admire even like are somewhat contemporary to me actually don't even a have social media or even have much of a following. Yeah. Like there's some directors I think about that I've met that also like were playwrights or they were like, they weren't even like they didn't direct ever. And they just became started doing it. And I look, you know, we're like friends on Instagram and they have like 1200 followers. Yeah. Like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. they clearly like they're, you know, social media persona obviously is not advancing their career. Because for me, I thought there was like this, like, I have to keep up our like company's image. There's like this poison because my Instagram is also our company's Instagram. So I'm constantly feeling like I got to feed this beast. And it was like, for what, dude, you're literally making a movie like you don't have to do this right now. Yeah, it's that whole brand thing. Like it, this has turned us yes. all into brands, which is kind of icky. It's icky and it totally is actual. Like it makes sense, but like there's a time and space for it. Like yeah. I would, if you look back, like you can see I posted some images, but it was like on a Saturday, I would schedule a time where I was like doing some prep and I was like, I'm going to post this really cool scouting photo, you know, yeah, or this like. But it wasn't like I was not doing Instagram stories. I wasn't posting every day. I wasn't commenting. Like my phone was not even, I didn't even have access to it. I mean, I would go a full week without even checking my email or my phone because literally the only people I needed to talk to knew how to find me or was my wife. 
that was it. Yeah. And all of that really connects with me and what you're saying. Cause I think there is a difference between, you know, branding and forced branding and, you know, honest, organic community, which is what I try to build with Film Riot and just what you're saying with how you did it. There were moments where you allowed people into the process, which I think that's a beautiful thing, creating that community and letting people learn and all that. But then there were times where you disconnected. You don't, you're not being a brand right now. You're, you're creating something that, you know, will hopefully impact people. And that's the most important thing in that moment. I think that's, that's my takeaway, at least from what I'm hearing you say is a great influence of when to shut it down and focus yeah. on, you know, the work and what's important about what you're currently doing, not those meaningless likes that you can you can get in that moment. Totally. And I think it was definitely a lesson that, that I'm more or less learning in just life in general that is almost shamefully attached to my phone is the difference I feel as a person with it and without this actual device yeah. attached to me because of what access is offered to it. Obviously there's positives around it, but like, I think the, there, there's an anxiety that gets produced. You know, if I'm totally honest, like I'm literally making my first movie with someone like Idris Elba, I'm in prep and I'm still feeling pangs of like jealousy and anxiety, just scrolling through Instagram. And I would, I, I'd have these moments, like I'm very reflective, like, prayerful person because of like what images of what other people are working on yeah and i'm like ricky oh my god dude how ungrateful do you have to be as a person to actually like have these thoughts but i think it's right. just our human nature is insecurity like at least i've discovered that because i'm like you're literally making a movie like yeah with idris Elba. there's like a million <laughs> directors that, that would trade positions with you like if you aren't just floating on a cloud of gratitude every minute of your freaking life, you have a problem. And I have a problem. And so I decided to get rid of what the conduit to that problem was my phone. And I felt like an actual difference in my creativity, in my ability to focus for long periods of time. Like literally my physical like brain adjusted to the fact that I didn't have a phone. Yeah. And so I stopped reaching for it, thinking about it. I like re-engaged things of like reading and you know I, it was just it's crazy <laughs> it's God, like, i, I, I almost feel that, like man. a crazy person talking about <laughs> no like a phone not at all power over you that is not crazy at all i would 100 percent relate to it not in making a feature but even just in um daily life like especially right yeah. now man i've me and my wife have instituted like once it's nighttime and you know the kids are in bed we're gonna hang the phone's completely go they're not even within reach and we chill and we watch yeah, a movie man. together or whatever and what you're saying i it totally relate to because the same for me the second that happens and we we remove that you know influx of news feed or whatever the hell it is but yeah man i, I love that you said all that I, I couldn't agree with it more but uh just last question which you kind of already answered but I'll just throw it out there one more time to see if it jars anything else. Yeah. There was a very quick, you know, turn, like we said, from your short to your feature. Is there something that you, if you had a time machine to go back to pre, you know, feature directed you, that you would, you would tell yourself to, to prep you for that first feature experience? The first thing that comes to my mind is how important those, you know, close collaborators were not in terms of like, cause they care about the movie as much as you, but allow allow you to be an unfavorable version of yourself you know like i feel very safe with dan stacy jeff and jen like i feel safe to say rude things be upset be tired be weak be silly be inappropriate like i have safe people and i think figure out who your safe people are because you're going into a very unsafe situation yeah it sounds like like you're going to be tested you're going to be tired you're going to be ornery, you're going to be challenged, scared, you're going to mess up, you're going to explode on set, you're going to do stupid things. Like you just need to have like a tight group of people that love you and like know that you're all in the shit together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like <laughs> because there's just like at least it seems like the first especially the first film for a lot of filmmakers is what I experienced where you have no money you have no time. And those are two, like time is the biggest thing that money gets you in my opinion. And being prepared is one thing, you know, I, I think also to include in that group would be have an AD 
I was telling you about Christo as my AD and a DP that you inherently feel the same safety and trust with. It's a different type of group because the producers are helping you manage the movie and the DP and the AD are helping you make the movie. If that makes sense. Yeah. And they interact with you at different spaces. Like those producers are forward thinking and building and planning and scheduling and you have to lead that. But then, you know, the AD and the DP are literally right next to you, like molding the clay on set. And, you know, the amount of times I snuck away with Christo to like have a cigarette and was like, dude, I'm like, I'm really shaking right now. Or I'm like, fuck, we didn't get that. Or like, just like I had someone safe to like express my weakness to. And so uh, to have someone who can like lift you up and support you like that was, uh, it was really exceptional. I, I would feel nervous and scared for a director going into a film without those types of people around him or her. Because if they don't have that, it is that is a lonely war to wage. It's just hard, man. It's just like, it's a really difficult experience. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Like, I'm talking about it like it's this terrible <laughs> thing. It's, but it's like anything. Like, you talk to people that get through, like, really hard battles and wars. Like, they're the... Cl- like. I felt like I went through this insane summer camp and we're all so close now and connected because of that experience. When you, uh, when you finished your last day of shooting, uh, day after the last day of shooting, how quickly were you like, man, I want to do that again. Or were you like, give me a minute. (laughs) I was not. Yeah. I didn't have that feeling until like several weeks, if not months in the post. <laughs> it's kind of like how your wife through labor and then she's like, never again. And then like a month later oh, holding yeah. the baby, she's like, I love oh, it. I could do this again. I You're know. like, what? I could do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not my wife. She's like, hell no. <laughs> she said that right after second son came out. She's like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and she did both our kids all natural. Oh wow. She is a warrior. Holy amazing. Crap. Yeah. Yeah. So she can say it with definitive <laughs> yeah, screw. Yes. Like, good definitive screw that <laughs> yeah yeah is uh yeah for me it was it took, once i started seeing the edit come together and i had those moments of like holy shit like we made a movie like, yeah. wow but initially i was still plagued by like like i had barely had time to watch dailies it was such a frenetic pace yeah i hate that feeling of what did we get today i mean dude you get so tired and lost like I mean that like that was like that moment with Idris was huge. I realized I was lost. Like I forgot where we were in the story and that dude pulled me back, (laughs) but it's the same. Like you watch the dailies. I was like, huh, that's pretty awesome. Actually. (laughs) Now that I've had two weeks of separation from it. So when you, after your like last day of shooting, did you have a feeling of, do we have a movie here? Did we get everything or did you, were you feeling good about it? It was both. And I felt really good about, some things and i felt very scared about other things like there's one scene in the movie that the first day of uh post i told our editor i don't know if there's an actual scene here that's how bad the shoot went so we spent two and a half weeks on one scene and it's now like we've done all these like test audience previews it's one of the favorited scenes in the movie it's oh, crazy. Wow. Like it is it is an editorial achievement like you've never seen that's incredible i mean i give all credit to luke our editor like obviously i sat there but like the first two weeks i just watched all the footage of the whole movie like dan and i literally watched every single frame and i was able to like mark all the clips up what i liked and that's what my editor worked on was that scene for two and a half weeks <laughs> like, <laughs> that's crazy yeah but it was a um and it's now it's just it's, it's glorious <laughs> it's like i can't even see the seams anymore but it was definitely like uh, he built something out of nothing, in my opinion. I mean, obviously, I shot everything that's in there, but it was a chaotic night of a lot of actors, horse stunts, and crazy. I was just I was like, why am I shooting with horses? This is insane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First feature was just a bunch of animals. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, like hard animals. Like, it was crazy. <laughs> definitely don't suggest that. But. Well, I really appreciate it, man. Uh, this was fantastic. I, I got a lot out of it. So I know uh, our audience is going to get a lot out of it. And I really cannot wait uh, to see the film, which I'm I'm guessing you, you're not sure about release date just yet. Yeah, everything is. I mean, we literally finished, like wiped our hands, done, done, like a week before the world got shut down, which yeah. I'm so grateful for uh, that it's done. 
but now it's like just a patience game of like you know uh, we have really smart salespeople and there's a lot of figuring out where and when and how but we're also just trying to figure out what the heck's happening yeah in the world and what will be best for it but it is finished so that i'm thankful for that's awesome man well i definitely look forward to uh to seeing the final product whenever you guys do release it no i appreciate it i will be excited for you to see it (laughs) And that's it for this episode. And as always, a big thank you to Ricky for taking the time to chat with us. Of course, jump over to filmriot.com forward slash podcast. Find the episode page for this episode and you'll find links of how to connect with Ricky online. You can find his website and more of his work there as well. You can find me online at twitter.com forward slash Ryan underscore Conley. And if you dug this episode, jump over to iTunes, leave a review and subscribe. That stuff helps us out a ton. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. Thank you.